Hi, I want to talk to you real quick about chapter two in our textbook, Digital Radiography and Packs by Christy Carter and Beth Veal. I would encourage you to consider going ahead and subscribing, hitting the bell notification, and we'll get into some learning. Here's the objectives I've determined for us to look at today. Um, sorry the slide cut out here, but we'll talk about the difference between analog and digital. We'll look at pixels and image matrices. Uh, we'll look at matrix size and field of view, how these influence uh, image quality. We'll look at different standards uh, for measuring exposure indication. We'll talk about image brightness, contrast, spatial resolution, and then we'll talk about image noise. And finally, uh, the one that got cut off is talking about a modulation transfer function, detective quantum efficiency, and exposure latitude. Of course, all of these objectives are also listed in the textbook. So some key terms that are going to be helpful for us, I've identified here, and I've kind of cherry-picked a few um, and, and gotten rid of a couple, so you may want to look at this list versus what's uh, there listed in the textbook. All right, let's start off by talking about analog versus digital. Uh, there's two types of images out there. There's analog, which are anything that captures or measures a continuously changing signal. And so an example of this, maybe from the musical world, would be a trombone, where a trombone has a sliding scale. And so of these illustrations here on the right, we have illustration A, which kind of shows that sliding scale of a continuously changing signal. Versus a, a digital signal is going to be something that has a discrete numerical value, which means that it's been recorded as small elements that can be processed in various different ways. Discrete means that it, it only one thing represents that one thing. So an example of that would be like a piano. Another way of looking at this distinction between analog and digital is to think about different types of ways of telling time. So for example, an old-fashioned wristwatch, the hands move continuously around the face, so the second hand's always moving, um, and it indicates every possible time of day, versus a digital clock is only capable of representing finite numbers of times, like every tenth of a, of a second. All right. Now pixels are going to be these very tiny things that we're using to represent in uh, digital data. So we're not necessarily working with uh, trombones or musical signals or anything like that. We're using, we're using digital uh, imaging signals and a pixel is going to be that element that we're talking about having that discrete digital value. Um, so it is the smallest uh, possible uh, component of the image, of a digital image. And if you magnify this uh, il illustration here from the textbook, you can actually see what those pixels look like. Now pixel size, as we can see, is very influential to what the human eye can actually see. And the size of the pixel is directly related to the amount of spatial resolution or detail in the image. So the smaller the pixel, the higher the spatial resolution. Pixel size change when the matrix size changes, which is what's illustrated here on the right. We have a matrix that um, looks like 10 by 10 on the left versus a, ma a matrix that's 20 by 20. And clearly the 20 by 20 matrix has much smaller pixels. So though the matrix is larger, the pixels are much smaller. Now spatial size is not the only way that we measure a pixel's actual data size. The other dimension has to do with how many different shades of gray can be recorded by any given pixel. And so we refer to this as the pixel's bit depth. This is going to be expressed as 2 to the power of something because again we're working within a binary system. So for example, a pixel with a bit depth of 8 is 2 to the power of 8 or 256 shades of gray can be held within that pixel. This gray level is a factor in determining the image contrast level. So here's just an illustration of what that looks like, different bit depths. And as you can see, with the bit depth of one, we just have two shades of, of, of color versus a bit depth of two, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the matrix, to go back a few slides, is all of these little squares that are arranged in columns and rows. And in the digital image, the numbers correspond to discrete pixel values. So this is a way of spatially representing digital information. So each box within the matrix corresponds both to a specific location in the image and a specific area of the patient's tissue. Now as the size of the matrix increases, we're going to see the pixels get smaller. So the larger the matrix, the larger the image size and the better the spatial resolution, but the smaller the pixels. So this image is digitized both by position, that's the spatial location, 
and the intensity, that gray value that's registered there for any given pixel. So let's look at that with different uh, for a given field of view. The larger the matrix size, the greater the number of little tiny pixels, and the increasing the number of those little tiny pixels will improve the quality of the image. So matrix A is 64 by 64, matrix B is uh, 215 by 215, and so on. Clearly, matrix D has the highest spatial resolution, the best image quality because of its um, decreased pixel size and improved or increased matrix size. Now field of view is also tied to this. The term field of view is synonymous with x-ray view field or portal view. Um, it's the amount of the body or the patient that's included in the image. And the larger this field of the view, the more area is imaged. So changes in the field of view do not affect the matrix. I'll make sure to repeat that. Changes in the field of view do not affect the size of the matrix. Well, what do they affect though? All of these three things are interrelated. Pixel size, matrix size, field of view, all of them are interrelated. And it's a fairly complex relationship. But basically, a matrix size can be changed without affecting the field of view, and a field of view can be changed without affecting the matrix. So what changes? The change is the size of the pixels. If we increase the matrix size, the pixels decrease um, in size. If we increase the field of view, though, the matrix, while keeping the matrix the same, the pixel size would have to increase. So by increasing the field of view, we would have a decrease in spatial resolution. Changing gears a little bit, one other significant technical consideration when we're looking at digital images is that we cannot look at the image and make a determination on whether or not the exposure was appropriate. We need to rely on the computer to tell us a little bit about how what the exposure level was was and that's what we're talking about when we use exposure indicators so exposure indexes is these amounts of exposure received by the image receptor whatever that image receptor may be and not necessarily to the patient right um, so it's the latent beam that's exiting the patient and exposing the image receptor knowing how these exposure factors um, work is key to providing sufficient exposure to create a diagnostic image now the difficulty with this is that manufacturers differ in the way that exposure is numerically represented. So we've been asking for a clinical standard exposure indicator for a long time. Um, we still have yet to see it. Now we are working towards something called a deviation index and it is going to help us in having something like a standardized exposure indicator or exposure index. But to understand the deviation index, we first need to talk about air KERMA, which we've briefly addressed in radiation biology and protection. KERMA stands for kinetic energy released per unit mass of air. And so this is a measurement of the amount of radiation energy or work that's being done in a volume of air. Often it's expressed as joules per kilogram or simply the unit gray. We can use this KERMA in order to track what the actual exposure was at the at the image receptor versus what we would expect the exposure to be. And then we can calculate between those two and come up with a deviation index. How much did what was exposed in the image receptor differ from what we expected to see at the image receptor? So this gives us a very easy way to make a quick judgment, was it overexposed or underexposed? Now, as we're looking at digital images, there's a tendency to look at the brightness level or the contrast level and make those determinations of was the uh, exposure sufficient. That actually shouldn't be the case, although we still need to look at brightness and contrast as a means to evaluate whether we've got a high quality image. So brightness refers to the appearance of the image on a display monitor. Um, there's no technical adjustment during image acquisition that will change the brightness of the image. It is strictly a display quality. It only has to do with the display of the image on a monitor. Versus contrast resolution, this refers on the ability of an entire digital system to display subtle changes in the shades of gray. In this contrast resolution in digital image is directly related to the bit depth of the pixels in the image. I'll say that again. Contrast resolution for a digital imaging system is related to that bit depth. How many different shades of gray can any given pixel within the, within the image receptor and the, the computer represent on a, for any given pixel? 
All right, one last consideration we need to think about when considering the quality of digital images and whether or not we've got a sufficient uh, diagnostic quality in our images is spatial resolution. I've alluded to it several times in talking about matrix size and field of view size and pixel size, but let's break it down one more time. The ability of an imaging system to demonstrate small details of any object, it is sometimes also called high, um, high contrast resolution, um, is what we're referring to as spatial resolution. So the dynamic range of the image does not equate to a higher spatial resolution. The only thing that can change the spatial resolution is smaller pixels. So the smaller the pixels get, the higher the spatial resolution. Oftentimes this is expressed as a formula called a modulation transfer function or MTF and this expresses the ability of a system, an entire system, to record available spatial frequencies. So it quantifies the contribution of each system component to the overall efficiency of the entire system and it's generally given in a range of 0 to 1. So 1 would be absolutely perfect or 100% and anything less than that is less than 100%. Now, anything that interferes with the formation of an image, we will refer to as noise. Noise is not good. Noise is the enemy. So this can happen during acquisition of an image if the equipment's malfunctioning or if we just don't have sufficient technique. This is seldom the case in radiation therapy uh, that quantum noise is the issue. Very often the noise is, results from the equipment itself. So, but to consider all the different ways we can measure noise, two things that are going to be helpful is the noise power spectrum, and this describes the spatial frequency content of the noise, as well as other characteristics, and the signal to noise ratio, versus, which means how much noise can be tolerated by a given viewer of the image. So one way to think about these different ways of, of talking about noise is imagine that we go out to the patient waiting room to, to bring back a patient, and the television's on, it's really, really loud, and the patient's talking really, really quietly. Right, so um, I can I cannot hear the patient's quiet voice over all the noise of the TV. That would be a low signal to noise ratio. Versus if I go out to the waiting room and the television's still loud, but the patient's yelling, chances are I can still hear the patient because they're yelling over the noise. That would be a high signal to noise ratio. Um, it would be that much higher if I could turn down the volume on the TV. Now the final thing that we want to look at is exposure latitude. This has to do with how broad an area in which we can make an exposure where we will still get an image, right? So latitude depends largely on the image detector. The higher the dynamic range of the detector, i.e. the more shades of gray it can represent, um, the higher the exposure latitude. Um, the exposure latitude of digital imaging systems is much broader than what it was in the days of film. So we have a tremendous amount of play in these digital systems in which to acquire an image. Now ways that we can improve in exposure latitude do have to do with increasing things like bit depth, but they also have to do with the actual hardware that we're using to acquire the images. So the detective quantum efficiency is a term referring to how efficient is the image receptor at taking a x-ray photon and um, turning that into a signal that can be processed by the computer. So the DQE is a measurement of the percentage of x-rays that are absorbed when they hit the detector. A system with a higher detective quantum efficiency can produce a higher quality image at a lower patient dose. This informs one of the major reasons why we've moved um, from photostimulable phosphor technology to flat plate technology. Flat plate has a higher DQE. So, things like amorphous selenium, amorphous silicon, thin film transistors, charge couple devices have an increased DQE over the photostimulable phosphor systems. Amorphous selenium detectors currently have the highest DQE because they do not have to convert things to light. These are the direct um, radiography systems. So there's no light spread, there's no blur, there's less uh, dose, and uh, higher quality images are going to be produced. The area of a TFT array is limited because of matrix structure. So this affects the size and number of pixels available. This is sometimes referred to as a fill factor. The larger the area of the TFT photodiodes, the more the radiation can be detected and the greater the signal is generated. So the greater the area of a TFT array, the higher the DQE. 
Now, what I'm talking about is the actual hardware of these little thin film transistors. As it increases in size, we can decrease the, we can decrease the pixel size and increase the number of pixels while not losing any information. So that's what we're talking, to, uh, talking about when we talk about a fill factor. I would, I would encourage you to read over this material pretty closely in the textbook. Well, thank you so much. I know this is a pretty quick presentation. Um, I still encourage you to go back over the textbook. The summary is particularly helpful. Quiz yourself using the review questions at the end of the chapter, and I'll see you in the discussion forums.